welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast with me, Dr. Janine Anderson. Heads up, this show may contain adult language and may mention specific foods. If you find either of those to be too triggering, I trust you to take care of yourself and do what you need to do. Hello, my friends. Just wanted to say a quick thank you before we get into that episode today. I feel so excited and honored that this is the finale of season three, that there are 30 good solid episodes out there in the world to help everyone. I wanted to say a special thank you to the people who email me and write me from very, very far away. So recently there have been emails from Taiwan and New Zealand and Botswana and the UK and South Africa and Australia. And there is no other way that I would be able to connect with people except for through this podcast, which is one of the most humbling and mind-blowing parts of getting to do this. So I thank you so, so much. Thank you for listening. I did want to give you a heads up about a couple of things. So in this episode with Dr. Main, she does mention weights a couple of times. In thinking about this episode, I've chosen to leave those numbers in there. And the weights are not overall body weights. They're average weight gains that are expected during puberty and menopause. And the reason why I've chose not to have my editor cut those out is because they are really important to understanding what our bodies are supposed to do. And part of that is that a normal amount of weight gain is expected in puberty and then again in menopause. So those weights will be mentioned if you're not in a good spot to listen to those then you can go ahead and sit this episode out and potentially come back to it later. Again, they're not overall body weights. They are talking about what it can be expected in terms of weight and height growth in puberty and then weight in menopause and why that weight gain is actually really helpful and vital to the function of what is going on for your body hormonally at that point. The other thing I wanted to ask from you is that if you are listening to this podcast and you find it helpful, I really, really, really need for you to do me a favor and review it on iTunes. So when you open up your phone and you open up the podcast app on your iPhone, you go into the podcast app. I really hate the new setup. Like at the time of this recording, it's the end of 2017 and I really hate the setup. So what you'll need to do to do a review is search for it. So you'll hit the little search button at the bottom, type in the name of the podcast, and this is going to bring up the podcast in the podcast app, not on your personal Listen Now feed. So when you're looking at it in that view, you're going to scroll down a little bit, kind of midway down the page, and you'll see there's a ratings and review, and you can give it a star rating, and or you can also write in a review. It really, really helps me. If you rate it with a star review, it helps me even more. If you rate it with a written review as well, that helps me to give feedback to my sponsors who are really gracious to help me financially with the podcast. It helps me to pay for the editing fees of the podcast. And then also way more importantly, it's really important in helping other people find the podcast. Podcasts that have more episodes and more ratings come up higher in search rankings. So if you want other people to be able to find the podcast or you think that they would find it helpful in the future, then really consider going ahead and giving a review at this point. That would really greatly help me out. As usual, I will be taking a little bit of a break between podcast seasons, getting ready to do season four. There will be a season four. It will be the same as usual, a 10 episode season. As far as I know at this point, I have some really amazing guests lined up for you already, which I'm very excited about. A couple of the episodes are already done and recorded. So the tentative start date for season four of the podcast will be during the last week of February of 2018. That's NIDA Week, National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. That's also the revised launch date for my book. I know a few of you have asked and I did have an intended (laughs) publication date of October 16th of this year. However, and I think I've mentioned this a few times, I was really lucky to have my private practice expand by a lot of staff members. So now there are seven of us. 
And that just took a lot of time to take care of. And for the time being, that's where my priorities really needed to be. So my intention is to get this book out into the world, launch that during Need a Week and have the podcast come back during Need a Week. So send me all of your productive vibes and prayers and good thoughts so that we can make that happen. I am working on it. I have not forgotten. And thank you so much to all of you who write and are still interested and are still encouraging about (laughs) how you want that to happen. I will make it happen. It's kind of a matter of when. So until then, enjoy this episode with Dr. Margo Main, who is amazing. As you'll hear in the episode, she founded everything in the field in eating disorders that's important. She's a hero of mine. She's so wonderful. And I will see you all again in February. Dr. Margot Main, PhD, CEDS, is the co-founder of Main and Weinstein Specialty Group. She is a licensed psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist who has specialized in eating disorders and related issues for over 30 years. She is the author of several books, including the following, Pursuing Perfection, Eating Disorders, Body Myths, and Women at Midlife and Beyond. Treatment of Eating Disorders, Bridging the Research Practice Gap, co-edited with Dr. Beth Hartman McGilley and Doug Bunnell. Effective Clinical Practice in the Treatment of Eating Disorders, The Heart of the Matter, co-edited with William Davis and Jane Shore. The Body Myth, Adult Women and the Pressure to be Perfect, with Joe Kelly, John Wiley, and Father Hunger, Fathers, Daughters, and the Pursuit of Thinness, and lastly, Body Wars, Making Peace with Women's Bodies. Dr. Main is a Senior Editor of Eating Disorders, the Journal of Treatment and Prevention, a founding member and fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders and a member of the Founders Council and Senior Board Advisor to the National Eating Disorder Association. Dr. Main is a member of the psychiatry departments at the Institute of Living slash Hartford Hospital's Mental Health Network and at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, having previously directed their eating disorder programs. She serves on several advisory committees, including the Renfrew Center Clinical Advisory Board, the Renfrew Foundation Conference Committee, and the Walden Clinical Advisory Board. Dr. Main is the 2007 recipient of the Lori Irving Award for Excellence in Eating Disorder Awareness and Prevention, and the 2015 recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award, both given by the National Eating Disorders Association, and is the 2016 honoree of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. Dr. Main lectures nationally and internationally on topics related to the treatment and prevention of eating disorders, female development, and women's health. She has devoted much time and energy to addressing federal policy related to eating disorders through her work for the National Eating Disorder Association and the Eating Disorders Coalition for Research Policy and Action, having served as vice president and chaired the policy section of the FREED Act which stands for Federal Response to Eliminating Eating Disorders, which was introduced into Congress by Representative Patrick Kennedy in February 2009 and Senator Harkin in 2010. It is absolutely no understatement to say that Dr. Main is a giant and a founder of our field, and I am so beyond honored to have her here with us today. Dr. Main, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. It's wonderful to be with you. So just to get started, I read off your very lengthy, extensive bio because you are such a huge influencer in our field and you've done so much. All of us professionals owe you, young professionals like myself in the field certainly owe you for creating such a great foundation. But I wanted to hear a little bit, this is what we usually start with with guests, is how'd you wind up in the eating disorder field? Well, that's a great question. And well, I've been treating eating disorders for over 35 years. And uh, way back when I was in graduate school, my internships were at a local children's hospital. So this was, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, and we started to see girls primarily, uh, high school age, and then and then a little bit older, come to us with anorexia primarily. And then we started to get some bulimic cases. And it was at a time in my progression as a as student, as a doctoral student, uh, that I needed to figure out what I wanted to specialize in and uh, do my doctoral research in. And I had always been interested in the psychology of gender. Mm-hmm. In fact, that is one of the things that had drawn me into psychology and then I only had one course on it. And <laughs> of course. In graduate school. <laughs> and I was lucky to have that, I guess. So I was always interested in gender and how it shapes us. I was always interested in the impact of the culture on our self-image and and values and things like that. I was interested in the mind-body connection and psychosomatic medicine. I was very 
very interested in uh, adolescent development and in family therapy. So it really brought together all of those interests when I started to see uh, young girls with uh, eating disorders. So that's how it started. I was working at a children's hospital and we just started to see a few cases. And then as we got to be known as a place where people could refer cases, we became a specialty program in Connecticut. So it happened indirectly. I didn't set out to treat eating disorders, but it just brought together a bunch of my interests. But I must tell you, way back then in the 80s, my mentors and supervisors all told me that I should not uh, specialize in eating disorders. Mm. That First of all, I was too young. Nobody says that anymore. <laughs> um, but secondly, uh, secondly, um, eating disorders were just a fad, and I would have nothing to do in a few years. Yeah. So scroll forward 35 plus years, and I've had plenty to do, and you do too, and yeah. everyone listening on this call has plenty to do. So unfortunately... I was right and they were wrong. Um, unfortunately, I was right that eating disorders, what we were seeing was just the tip of the iceberg and that it was going to really grow and evolve and affect so many people throughout our culture and now worldwide. So I wish that I had been wrong and, and they had been right. I really do because of the suffering it causes. Yeah, me too. I always tell people there's nothing that would make me happier than if I really had to switch specialties and I didn't have a job in this anymore. But unfortunately, I just don't think that that is going to happen. I agree with you. So how did you decide to found everything in the entire eating disorder field? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just a matter of opportunity. You know, it's been very exciting to be part of a field that is taking off. And mm. uh, so, yeah, I was lucky to be one of the founders of the National Eating Disorders Association. I'm still so proud of, of NIDA and mm -hmm. all we do. I'll be at a board meeting next week and at their annual gala next week and our reach across this country to women and men and boys and girls and all genders, all ages is just phenomenal. So I'm very excited about having been part of that from, from the get-go. Also, I was a founding member of the Academy for Eating Disorders and, and that's exciting too. Mm. And there have been other opportunities like being one of the first um, senior editors on the Eating Disorder Journal of Treatment and Prevention just great opportunities, and it's because my generation was a bunch of pioneers in eating disorders, and now we have you folks, the younger group, to be handing things off to and teaching each other us. We will learn from you, and you will learn from us. That's very gracious of you to say. I'm so honored. I think I told you right before we started recording, I was like, oh my gosh, I respect you so much. I actually am nervous to talk. Um, <laughs> No need to be nervous. So I'm sure we're going to talk about psychology of gender a lot more. That's very interesting to me as well. Unfortunately, I only had one course in psychology of gender as well, which is pretty ridiculous. But um, yeah, uh, you would think between the time I was in school and the time you were in school, there might be a little bit more going on. Huh? All right, come on. Like we're supposed to make advancement. The main thing that we're talking about today, and I hope if you have time, you'll come back and do another episode with us because I certainly would love to talk about father hunger. But today we're going to talk about eating disorders in midlife, um, because you've just been an absolute leader in understanding eating disorders in midlife. So I was wondering for people out there who are listening, who aren't familiar on any of the background, like what eating disorders in midlife look like, are they common? Are they not? If you could kind of give us an overview for what you know, because you literally wrote the book on this. <laughs> Well, uh, I do have this habit of writing books um, and writing <laughs> books about things that nobody else has written about before. So again, kind of pioneering, but really great to be able to help other people understand what I understand, help, you know, share my experience and, and perhaps lead. Well, my interest in adults with eating disorders uh, just emerged gradually. I had noticed that a number of the um, parents that, of the young women I treated back at the children's hospital had issues of their own, and um, but didn't really want to admit them. They wouldn't put a label on them. Uh, they wouldn't talk about their own issues. They were very focused on getting help for their kid. But one strange thing happened. After I had treated various young kids who were teenagers when they came and maybe left by the time they uh, started college or mid-college and they were they were better and I, I didn't have anything to do with them anymore. And then a couple of years would go by and I would get a call from, from a mom. And this happened with a bunch of cases. And the mom would tell me that she actually also had an eating disorder, but she hadn't been ready to talk about it mm. back when her child was ill. So that started to give me a little bit of a window on what we had not been able to get out of the closet yet. So I started treating some of these adult women and really enjoying the work and helping them to see the work that they needed to do to help their daughters and sons not only get better, but stay better. And there was 
one case that uh, really made me decide I need to write a book about this. And it was uh, a woman who came to me. She was in her early 40s. And she had been eating disordered um, pretty much her whole life. Her family had started bringing her to Weight Watchers when she was 12 years old. Mm. Uh, she was just going through the normal changes a girl's body goes through in a pre-adolescence. Girls between the ages of like about 12 and 15 need to gain between 40 and 50 pounds and between um, 10 and 12 inches. That's just what happens with the natural evolution of things. And children's growth is, is uneven. Um, so at that time when girls are going into puberty, they might get a little bit of a belly before then. And they, they fill out a little bit and then they, then they grow tall a little bit. But she was the oldest girl in her family, and her, her, her parents were astounded by her having gained weight and having a little bit of a belly. So instead of understanding that it was a natural part of life, they brought her to Weight Watchers and started her on a lifelong battle with her body. And that persisted throughout middle school and high school years. She went off to college and came back um, anorexic, did not get treatment at that time, ended up being able to finish college kind of got herself better, didn't really get any treatment, is a very accomplished woman, you know, has a graduate degree or two, very active in her career um, and community, and had two children. And during all that time, she never, ever felt good about her body. She never ate really well, but she had gotten to an okay weight and certainly was able to have two normal pregnancies, etc. But after the second pregnancy, she was not able to lose all the weight that she had gained during the pregnancy, and she started doing all kinds of eating disordered things even more than she had before. For the first time, started to exercise abusively, and then mm-hmm. she started to purge via vomiting. So she was restricting, exercising excessively, and purging, and she lost about 20 to 25 pounds in the year before she came to me. And she didn't have that much, she didn't have weight to lose. She was at a stable weight, which was her, you know, her natural weight. Before she came to see me, she had been very uh, baffled by her behaviors and what she was doing. And she didn't really know what was wrong with her. She thought maybe she had an eating disorder, but she didn't know much about them. So she had decided to go to her OBGYN and talk to him about this problem and see if he thought it was an eating disorder and what he would recommend. Uh, she expected when she went to his office that the nurses and staff might say positive things about her weight loss because everybody was saying that. So she expected that, and that wasn't helpful to her, but she knew that that might happen. What she didn't expect was that when the doctor walked into the room, his first words to her were, how does your husband like your new body? There was no distress about her having lost 25 pounds in a year mm-hmm. on a body that didn't have 25 pounds to lose. Um, and and for no... somebody else's pleasure, you know? Yes, right, right. How does your husband like your new body? I must tell you, that was one of the most inspiring moments I've ever had in terms of realizing we have to get this subject out into the medical world and the mental health world and into people's psyches. Uh, she, of course, that day didn't tell him what she really came for because she was so distressed by what he had said. She was blown away and depressed and left thinking that she was doomed to just live this life uh, that she didn't quite understand. But within a couple of weeks, she was on the internet and she found my name and I wasn't too far away. So we were able to begin to work together. And that's the kind of story that I can give you, you know, time after time. That's how I developed this interest in adult women. And I think it's really unfortunate that our biases are that it's just white young women, you know, high school and college age women who get these eating disorders. It is women of all ages. It Mm -hmm. is young children. It is boys. It is every gender identity group that we have. And now it's a global issue. So there isn't anybody who's immune from this, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the, I saw you speak at the IADEP Symposium. And one of the things that you mentioned was how common eating disorders are in women in midlife. And specifically, you compared that to the rate of breast cancer. And my I almost fell out of my chair. My mind was just blown. Will you tell our audience about that? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. This is truly mind blowing. I think everyone who hears this this statistic uh, has that same reaction. It's a fact that truly surprised me. Eating disorders are actually now more prevalent than breast cancer in women over the age of 50. I'm just going to repeat that. Eating disorders are now more prevalent than breast cancer 
in women over, you said 50? 50, yes. Wow. There was a very broad-based study done in 2012 by Dr. Cynthia Bulick and her research team. They do wonderful research in all different areas of eating disorders. They're really, they yeah. contribute so much to our field. Uh, and they found in the general population that of women over 50, 13.3% have a, a lifetime prevalence of eating disorders. And the lifetime prevalence for breast cancer is 12.4%. So again, eating disorders, 13.3% of adult women over 50, breast cancer, 12.4%. Uh, and that is truly mind-blowing. And yet no one talks about eating disorders in midlife or later years. You know, everyone wears pink ribbons and is aware of breast cancer. And, you know, I'm so appreciative of all of that. Me but too. we have to do the same thing for eating disorders that we've done for breast cancer. We have to get it out of the, the closet. There should be no shame about it. Women used to be ashamed of having breast cancer, and now they're not. Women have should not be ashamed of having an eating disorder. They need to be supported, and they need to be able to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I think was so mind-blowing about hearing that statistic is that, thankfully... There is a lot more awareness, support, action, research around breast cancer. And I feel like everybody knows somebody who's been touched by that, unfortunately. And I don't know if I could say the same about eating disorders because people tend to be pretty secretive, you know, for good reason about if they're struggling with it or if they've known someone who struggled with it. It would be wonderful to reduce the shame around that. I'm curious to yeah. hear, why do you think it is that we don't talk about eating disorders in midlife in general, but especially with women? Well, you know, I think that we have made it so much about young women, and we understand that there are tremendous pressures on young women and girls around body image, the media images, all of uh, what they are pressured to look like and be like. And we sort of have assumed that those things are over. Like you, you finish college and you no longer have like a troubled body image. Mm -hmm. Like you graduate from college or nursing school or you go into the service, wh whatever is your next rite of passage, and you leave behind any body image issues. <laughs> well, that isn't <laughs> quite the way it is. Not I really. I wish we could do that. <laughs> I wish we had a way to immunize people, but we don't. The thing uh, for adult women is that body image issues and weight concerns and eating disorders actually go hand in hand with aging. They're not separate processes. And in fact, there is a study that was done more recently. We just talked about the 2012 numbers from Dr. Bulick's group. In the United Kingdom, in this past few months, another study came out, and they found a 15% incidence of eating disorders in women at midlife. Oh my gosh. And in, in that study, what they also found is that, that only about a quarter of them got help. And I'm not even sure, Dr. Anderson, if a quarter of the women with eating disorders in our country are getting help. I'm not sure about that. I know more than ever before are getting help, but I'm not sure that we're reaching a quarter of them. Mm -hmm. But we have to start talking about this. I think with eating disorders in general, there is such shame and secrecy. I think people feel like they can't manage this very essential part of life. It's like if you can't manage to breathe, there's something wrong with you, and most people can manage to breathe. But eating is as essential to our life as breathing, and I think people have such deep shame that this is an area that they um, are so troubled by. And I think there are people with eating disorders are made fun of, they're misunderstood. Eating disorders are in some ways glorified up to a certain point, like women are supposed to be really, really thin until you get to a certain point, and then you're seen as totally defective. So we really have to get everyone talking about eating disorders more. And I think the medical community especially needs to do that. They need to be asking questions, especially with adult women, every time they see them about whether they are doing anything to affect their weight, whether they are eating normal amounts of food, and whether their menstrual cycles and, and uh, other processes are still normal. So we have to start talking about it. We have to stop pretending that it isn't an issue for older women. Mm -hmm. One of the most heartbreaking things for me is that I feel like a huge chunk of it is connected to our anti-fat bias and that it's uh, so connected to what weight people are at. For example, I got an email the morning of this recording from somebody who is in midlife who says, I've had this eating disorder my whole life. And I realized that it's actually an eating disorder, but I never thought it was. I thought I was just a failure at trying to lose weight. 
And yes, I just that's feel a like, flaw. oh, I know. I just feel like that is such a huge failing of so many different professions. So tell us a little bit about your experience with how women in midlife have come to seek treatment. What finally brings them in? Well, for a lot of women, what brings them in is having children and not wanting to pass the eating disorder along to the next generation. Mm -hmm. The woman I mentioned before whose OBGYN had said such an insensitive thing, actually, as we you know, started to meet in regular sessions, she came at the time that her daughter was 12 years old, and 12 years old was when her parents brought her to Weight Watchers. So a big part of our work together was to help her to support her daughter through mm -hmm. puberty and through all the body changes she was going to go through and to manage, you know, the comments that are made by family members and, and all of that. So for a lot of women at midlife who come in, they're really not coming for themselves. They don't want to pass this on to their son or daughter. And that's fine. I would prefer that they come in for themselves, but that is okay. So that's, you know, something you focus on in therapy. For some, they have started to realize that they have lost something because of the eating disorder. It's kind of come home to them that, you know, they may have broken a bone or they may have a lot of dental problems or they may have a lot of hair loss because of the eating disorder. Their GI system may be totally um, destroyed because of the purging or the laxative abuse, abuse or whatever. So they might be having medical problems. So sometimes you know, the body has started to wear down and give those messages, and that will be what gets someone in. But what we find with adult women is, you know, their lives are so complex that once they get in the door of treatment, we might want them to go for a higher level of care, but they can't do that. They have so many responsibilities. Most women are working and taking care of their families. Many women are either the sole breadwinner or the primary breadwinner, or at least a significant breadwinner in their um, families. And most women also, besides taking care of their own families, are taking care of sick relatives and sick neighbors and sick, sick mm -hmm. animals and, and everybody else who is in need. And so when it comes to taking care of themselves, they're not awfully good. They're, they tend to be able to take care of other people and not themselves. Mm -hmm. What are some of the unique aspects of being a woman and having an eating disorder midlife that, you know, our traditional lens of looking at it in young, predominantly white, cisgendered women, that, you know, misses out on how, like, give us some perspective on what it's like to be a woman in midlife with an eating disorder. Well, you know, the woman at midlife has this deep shame and embarrassment about having an eating disorder. So that makes her really push it underground and not talk about it. And she has had like more years of speaking what I call the language of fat. Actually, that wasn't my original term. Sandy Friedman from Vancouver developed that term originally, the language of fat, about how women are encouraged to not express negative feelings. And so all negative feelings kind of become, I feel fat. Uh, we don't, we're not allowed to have other negative feelings. So they've got, you know, years and years of, of translating all their feelings into the language of, of fat. They have a lot of difficulty admitting they need help. They have all these obstacles to treatment. They have increased anxiety about their appearance because they're getting older. As we get older, women in cultures like ours lose some of our influence and power because we aren't as youthful and therefore traditionally attractive in a culture like ours that is so objectifying. So women start to feel, if I have a thinner body, a younger looking body, a more sculpted body, I will not lose my power and influence in this world. So there's that. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the increasing concerns about health that come as we get older. And you mentioned before all the messages about obesity and weight and the BMI. Women get that constantly, that weight is totally associated with health and, mm -hmm. and you can't be too rich or too thin. And we also are given the responsibility of taking care of our family's health. And so it's not only your BMI you need to worry about, but your family needs to be thin too, and you have to feed them just so. So the kind of war on obesity that our culture has been waging is something that is in the laps of adult women much of the time. So that changes our experience as well. And it's hard for women who are struggling with an eating disorder to find ways to feed themselves that feel okay and feed their families. They, they know how to feed their families. They don't know how to feed themselves. And I think also in adult development, 
there are tremendous stressors and changes that we go through. When we think about eating disorders, the peak times to develop an eating disorder are the ages of 13 to 15. There's a lot going on there, you know, Mm -hmm. leaving middle school, going from elementary to middle, middle to high school, getting less adult supervision, having more responsibility of your own, all that kind of pressure. And then the other peak time is 17 to 19, where you're supposed to be deciding your future and know exactly what you're going to do and and be making all the right decisions to be sure you're there, you're extremely successful. And in both of those age periods, there's a lot of pressure on young women sexually. Between 13 and 15, her body is developing and she is aware of the comments and the attention and the objectification. And at 17 to 19, that continues and feeling that you have to be really a sexual being. So there's a lot about their bodies during those two age periods. So we know that transition times increase risk for eating disorders. Well, I hate to tell you, but adult life is full of transitions too. It's just that we don't have parties for them. I know. (laughs) It stinks. When you go through menopause, nobody has a party for you. (laughs) When you have to take, uh, start taking care of your parents because they're old and ill, no one has a party for you then. When you are sending your kids off to college and you're um, approaching an empty nest, there's no party for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no rite of passage for all these different challenging times in women's lives. So we see that women keep on walking into new chapters in their lives that are challenging and have a lot of pressure and responsibility and never losing any of the old responsibilities. And during this time, her body is also changing. As we age, our bodies change. Our metabolism slows down. So we are going to gain weight in midlife. And that's a hard thing for women who have been told their whole lives that they need to be thin and that they can control their bodies. And there's something wrong with them if they can't. Mm -hmm. So all those messages kind of collude and make midlife not an easy transition for most women. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to ask you a brief question, and then I'll get into one that's a little bit bigger to unpack. The first one is, can you just tell the audience briefly why women gain weight in their abdomen during menopause or after menopause? Yes, that's such an important question to talk about. And here's another example of something that most women don't know. And I didn't know what I'm going to tell you right now until I wrote my book, The Body Myth. And I'd already specialized in eating disorders for 20 years. I thought I knew a lot about my body and other women's bodies. But I didn't know this until when I was writing that book. The reality of women's bodies is that when we go through puberty, we have to increase the fat composition of our bodies up to about 17% in order to develop regular menstrual periods. Well, to develop our first menstrual period. And then to have regular menstrual periods over time, our body fat composition has to be about 22%. So that is just a natural change that happens in our bodies. When we go through menopause, the fat cells in our middle, our lower abdomen there, expand in order to produce estrogen, in order to offset the slowing down of the ovaries. Our ovaries are the organs that produce estrogen for us naturally. And as they slow down, as we go through menopause, then we have this other source of estrogen. And that will, in turn, keep our bodies from having as many hot flashes and other inconvenient aspects of of menopause. And it might also offset osteopenia and osteoporosis, bone issues that come up. So that's what happens in women's bodies. And that area right around our middle, which is where women will tend to gain weight, is the area, is our reproductive organs. So having the weight around our middle protects our reproductive organs. Mm Mm-hmm. I've heard several clients say, this is my wine gut as I'm getting older. I'm like, no, this is not, this is not your wine gut. Right, right, <laughs> right. I think I might have mentioned to you before that a woman that I treated who was in her 70s and I had talked to her about all of this, the next week she came in and she said to me, I used to see this roll around my middle as my spare tire and now I see it as my life preserver because that's mm. what it is. Women sometimes are kind of angry that we have to have more body fat than men do. But the reality is, with that 22% body fat, our bodies can stay alive for nine months. That's what it takes for a baby to come to to term. So it's about keeping the human race alive. And one last fact about this Mm -hmm. um, need to have fat on our bodies and the differences between men and women's bodies, because we have 
more fat reserve in order to keep us alive and keep the human race alive. Only 10% of women will die in a famine, but half of the men will die. So fat is really an essential part of our lives as women. It saves us and it saves the human race. And it shouldn't have that bad reputation that it's gotten. Yeah, that's the part that at this point in my life and in my recovery and professional work that I'm mad about is I don't really feel mad at my fat anymore, thanks to many, many, many therapy sessions. But I feel mad that that's considered something that's wrong when it's so clearly natural and connected to really important basic physiological functions. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's essential to human life. So I wanted to have you talk a little bit about eating disorders in midlife from kind of two perspectives. One, and give some background on the women who have had an eating disorder for a long time and have never gotten treatment, but now are deciding to in midlife. And then separately, women who actually develop an eating disorder midlife, they haven't had a problem with it previously, but now they are in their 50s and they do. Could you talk a little bit about both of those? Yeah, so I'll start with talking about the woman who's um, had it for a long time and then comes into treatment. And is there hope? That is certainly one of the things that every adult woman who comes into offices um, like yours and mine questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, that issue of shame. Most adult women, when they come in, are shamed. And they think we should be treating young women who we can really help and we shouldn't waste our time with them. They will always say those things. But in reality, the adult women who come in, even if they've been sick 20, 30, 40 years, there's still some recovery that they can get. And they might get really pretty complete recovery, or they might just get partial recovery. But it's certainly better than living with an eating disorder that is totally dominating you. And one of the things that I do in my practice is really try to partner with the woman who comes in, um, understand what are her symptoms now and how did her symptoms develop over time? You know, when did they start and when did they get worse and, and where are they now and what has helped her in the past? And then piece together what we could do now. But she has to have a very active voice in what we decide to do as a treatment plan. Some women might have symptoms that are both restricting, starving themselves, and binging or purging also. So where do we want to start with those symptoms? We can't do it all at once. So we partner around where do we start and how do we start setting some goals for those uh, symptoms. And I have to tell you that women can make much more progress than, than you think they're going to. When you look at a long history of you know 30 or 40 years and you think, oh my goodness, how is she going to get out of this? Women are incredibly resilient. And you know, there's a lot of great therapists out here. Mm-hmm. And between those two resources, so many women will get a lot better and sometimes even all better. I think it's important to be very respectful of your patients and help Mm -hmm. them to believe in themselves. That's the first piece, is believing in yourself. And some women will need more than outpatient help. They might need to be in a program as well. And it's a long journey, but you can always improve. So that's a little bit about the women who've had it for a long time. And you are right that there is a small percentage of women who develop eating disorders for for the first time as adults. And I haven't seen too many of them. I you see different estimates about what is the percentage of eating disorders that are in adult women that develop for the first time in that chapter of their lives. And I've seen recently someone saying 10% of adult cases of eating disorders are developed at the first time in adulthood. Mm-hmm. That isn't my experience. My experience would probably be more like 3 to 5%. But what we find in those women is that they might have really managed life quite well and Their body image experiences, their criticisms of their body, their eating and dieting and all that are well within the normal range of any other woman. You know, the normal woman in our culture does diet from time to time and does sometimes feel shame and embarrassment about her body. So there's a little bit of that that's normal. So these women had that to some normal extent and then get into a a stage later in life where despite having managed everything so well for so long, they just get kind of tipped over Mm. and they finally succumb to some of the messages that they've been getting but not listening to earlier in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think they are often quite mystified because they feel like they did so well until now. What's wrong with them? And that whole question, what's wrong with me, whether it's a woman who's had an eating disorder her whole life or whether it comes on later in life, that's the question that we have to start telling women. It's not that there's something wrong with you. There's something deeply wrong with our culture that tells you as a woman 
that you have to look a certain way and you have to be a certain way and that that is more important than any other aspect about you. Yes. Um, that your weight, your shape, your appearance, those are the essential aspects of your identity that you need to spend the most time on. And the way our culture objectifies women is a big ingredient in the development of any woman's eating disorder. So, you know, I work a lot with adult women in the same way I work with younger patients of trying to make them aware of how did they get this notion Mm -hmm. that they're supposed to look this way. And I get them to see that it isn't like something they created themselves, that this is the culture that we live in. This is the Kool-Aid we all have been drinking. And it's unhealthy, toxic Kool-Aid, and we have to stop drinking it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do a lot of that kind of awareness building in our adult patients. So that is a factor for the women who develop it for the first time. And they feel like they are particularly stupid to have succumbed because they didn't Mm. succumb to it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And I think it's important if you are you listening to this and you find yourself connecting with that to just hear that I want to validate the tremendous pressure that objectification of our bodies puts on women, especially Um, And what I've seen is the women I've worked with who are in midlife dealing with an eating disorder, particularly those who have developed an eating disorder later in life, not had one for many years, is that it's deeply connected to how their body is aging and that it's difficult to feel good about how your body is aging if everything in the culture around you is telling you you're not allowed to age. And I think a lot of people kind of go to controlling weight and then developing eating disorders as a way to almost compensate for other ways that their body may be aging. And I totally have a similar approach with that, with putting everything in context. Like, isn't that a bunch of bull that we are not okay with what happens with women's bodies? at really any point in their lives, but especially as they age, we're just going to toss aside all of the amazing experience that women, especially women who have more life experience, bring to the table. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I wanted to hear, because you brought up um, psychology of gender, and I think we would both openly self-identify as feminist women and incorporate feminist principles in our work in therapy, which means to put things within the cultural context in which people are experiencing them. The idea of the personal is political and the political is personal. Tell us a little bit about what you see the role of feminism as being in eating disorder recovery. Well, I I think that uh, feminism is really an important part of our understanding of eating disorders, of how they develop and why they develop and what will sometimes be useful in terms of preventive strategies and also what helps in terms of the changes a woman has to make in terms of her view of herself and of the world. We have to look at the cultural pressures that we put on all women and the way in which women are objectified and reduced to their bodies and reduced to sexual objects in Western culture. We have to start seeing what cost that is to women's health. So I will talk to my patients of all ages about the culture and the pressures that they feel from our culture and help them to see that these are, if you will, man-made and women-made pressures. They are not things that we are necessarily naturally supposed to feel. And having examples of uh, like what happened in Fiji when American television was first available and they went from a culture that had no eating disorders to a culture with a lot of eating disorders and a lot of body concerns and dieting and all of that. So I give them examples of research in other cultures. But also, I think that we have to talk about just how they feel objectified. How have they felt about their bodies? Mm -hmm. And try to help them articulate what those experiences have been to them by also talking about what women's position is in the world. That helps us also to see why we might use our bodies as a source of power. And unfortunate truth is that women are half of the world's population and we work two-thirds of the world's work hours, but we only receive 10% of the world's income Mm -hmm. and we own 1% of the world's property. So we are over half of the population, but we only own 1% of the property. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. that in and of itself will tell you that there is something wrong with this picture and that perhaps women's investment in their bodies is a way of trying to offset this other lack of power that we have in the world. So I think becoming aware of feminism, of 
the rights that women have had to fight for and the ways in which women are still not treated as equal in our culture. The United States Congress is about 19% female, and that's the highest it's ever been. We have 20 female senators for the first time, and the other house, I think, is about 17%, so it comes out to be about 19%. It might even be 18%. And so here we have, (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. just one statistic to throw out there. We don't have equal power with men. And we are told constantly that our appearance is really, really important. And that is something we can change. We may not be able to be sure we're going to get equal power in our workplace, in our career, in our educational opportunities. But we know that we can change our bodies and look better. So, again, I think it's really important to help women to see that and to start realizing that by spending a lot of time thinking about our bodies and thinking about our weight and criticizing ourselves, we are not spending the time we need to on improving the lives of children and women in our country and across the globe, that it is a waste of our energy and our resources, and it will never, ever get women ahead. Mm. It will only keep us in our place. Ooh, that just gave me a chill. Yeah. I know that we're coming close to the end of our time today, unfortunately, but I did just want to ask you if you have some pointers on how women who are, or anybody who's trying to recover can fight back against the beauty myth, the thin ideal against objectification of their body in in general? Yeah. Well, one thing we all can do is kind of take inventory of who in our personal lives helps us to feel better about ourselves as people and better about our bodies and who drags us down into the mud. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one place to start. And then you have to make some changes based on that. A lot of women, um, unfortunately, their peer groups are full of other women who are struggling in the same way and who compete with each other around appearance. And that's not healthy. It's going to be very difficult for you to get better if that's the world you're stuck in. In fact, one of the women I talked about earlier, that was a, a huge challenge for her to change the people that she associated with because everyone she spent time with as other women, you know, they were running together and they were competing together and they were dieting together and it was not at all healthy. So she had to really change all of that. It's kind of like what drug addicts or an alcoholic have to do to get better. They have to change the influences around them. Mm -hmm. So that's one place to start. And then you have to start changing your internal messages to yourself. Sometimes I ask women to on one day, just write down the negative feelings you have about your body and what you say to your body during the day. Just write those down in kind of a long list. And then we'll look at them together. And in a day, they might have had 39 different horrible thoughts about their bodies. Mm -hmm. So where do we start? And where do we start countering them? And how do we develop a mantra or a counter message for themselves? Doing, you know, cognitive restructuring, that kind of work. So those are some things that we begin to do. And just continue to increase their awareness of the things that affect them and to start fighting back. And I think the other piece of this is that we really have to get medical providers to be paying attention to this. It's really time to make eating disorders in adult women visible Mm -hmm. and important in our healthcare agenda. Medical providers need to learn about the female body and our psychosocial experiences and how that creates risk for eating disorders. They have to start screening for eating disorders. We have to also, you know, as clinicians, start developing the kinds of programs that adult women need. You know, maybe it's difficult for her to get to outpatient therapy during the week because they have jobs and childcare and all of that. But maybe in your practice, you could have a Saturday morning program that's a group that's three hours instead of, you know, trying to splice together a couple of different appointments during the week. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can fit into women's lives a little bit better? Because women are managing so many. Uh, there's, you know, they're juggling so many balls at any given time. So I think there's a lot of challenges for us as providers and for the women that we are trying to help. But more than anything, women really need to feel safe telling the stories about their bodies. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we, just like breast cancer, we have to help everyone to see that eating disorders are a life-threatening illness and not a character flaw. Mm-hmm. You know, that. Again, get, getting back to that similarity with breast cancer. These are life-threatening illnesses that many people will get better from. They're not character flaws. Right, absolutely. And also to help women to and people realize that 
it's not silly to have concerns about your body like this. It makes so much sense in the bigger context. This is where so much of your power comes from. Yeah, body image is part of self-image. It just can't can't be 100% image. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay to care about your body and to want to improve it and to want to be strong and to want to be attractive. But you have to see how much of your energy it's taking and at what point is it trying to meet other people's standards rather than what is really right for you. Mm -hmm. Tell us what makes you feel hopeful about people recovering from eating disorders. Oh boy, just that question makes me smile. I have seen so many women just slowly, very, very slowly begin to get their power back. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll just tell one little anecdote. I think it's just so telling. Um, I was treating a woman, she was in her probably mid-40s when she came to me. And she had had an eating disorder probably since maybe 19 or 20. So she was probably about 45-ish when she came to me, about 25 years of an eating disorder. And it had been pretty severe. All we did was outpatient treatment. And she um, gradually was able to gain control of her symptoms. She was no longer purging. She was eating much more normally. She was still struggling with accepting her body. But one day uh, she came in and it was just a sign of the progress she had made very slowly, bit by bit. It was around the holidays, and Mm. she was supposed to go to a holiday party on the weekend. And as she was putting on her pantyhose, she was saying all the same old things to herself about how horrible her body was and how people were going to think she was fat and how fat her legs were and all of that. And then she said to herself, Margot's right, I am a goddess. (laughs) I had never actually said to her, so-and-so, you're a goddess, but I had conveyed to her that she is a goddess and I had conveyed to her how important it was for her to honor herself and be proud of her body and to stop beating herself up all the time. So she had internalized all those messages into Margot's right, I am a goddess. Mm -hmm. And she was able to, you know, put the pantyhose on (laughs) and go to that party and not beat herself up and hate herself the entire time she was there. It was like this turning point in her therapy. Mm -hmm. So Women can get to that feeling, even if they've been 25 or 30 years feeling the exact opposite of that. And I think it is up to us to show the way, to show the light, and to be very respectful of the women who come to us. Not, I think lots of the medical providers they see convey disapproval, and it just makes them feel more ashamed. And we can't add to the shame that they already feel. We have to empower them and help them see their strengths, and then it will come. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's a wonderful anecdote. I would encourage people to, I mean, all of your books are wonderful. Um, The one that really our conversation is most closely connected to is Pursuing Perfection, which is about women with eating disorders in midlife. And I would say even if you are not in midlife, I would encourage you to read that book because not only is it an excellent book, but I think the more you can give yourself kind of that big picture perspective of like over a lifetime, how do people experience eating disorders and anti-fat bias and objectification of their bodies, I think it's really helpful. So I would highly recommend it, even if you're listening to this podcast and you're not in midlife. Dr. Main, it's been absolutely wonderful talking with you today. Definitely a great honor of my career. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your time with us. Well, thank you, Dr. Anderson. And thank you for being one of the younger generation picking up where others of us have begun and left off. And we are doing very, very important work and we're not going to stop doing it. We're going to keep at it. Mm -hmm. And I've got I've got a lot of years of this job ahead of me. So I've got to. And I'm not retiring. uh, (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. We'll be partnering together. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds wonderful. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Let's keep in touch. You can find all the information you need about the podcast at eatingdisorderrecoverypodcast.com, including full podcast episodes and links to all of our social media sites. You can join our Facebook group for the podcast by searching Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast on Facebook. This is a closed group for listeners of the podcast looking to connect, share resources, and get involved in a pro-recovery community. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. Talk to you next time on the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. Podcast.